And joining me from London via Skype to discuss the distribution of a vaccine to poorer nations and the current level of insufficiency is a medical doctor, Femi Oyekon. Dr. Oyekon, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, um, on the one hand, we're dealing with um, vaccine shortages. On the other hand, there is also um, vaccine um, hesitancy. For poor nations, it's more of the, uh, the fact that these vaccines are not, are not available. And for richer countries, they are available, but people are not willing to take them. But let's start with poorer nations. Um, how do you think that this will impact on our ability to recover quickly from this um, vi pandemic if we do not have vaccines available? Um, thank you for making me part of this conversation. Uh, I think the reality is... Um, if um, the poorer nations are not um, vaccinated as quick as possible, the possibility of um, returning to normalcy will be highly crippled because um, a lot of um, transactions, um, movement of people across the globe is now coined down specifically to um, coronavirus and either being having coronavirus negative status or being fully vaccinated um, with coronavirus. But you can also understand the peculiarity with Africa is the fact that there is about six of the vaccines that have been um, um, or, or authorized by WHO for emergency production. None of them is being produced in Africa. And if Africa needs to go via the um, straight road market, so talking about going directly to some of these companies to say, we want to get our people vaccinated. Africa, 1.2 billion population. Only 2% of that is being vaccinated through the COVAX way. No, we don't want this to happen. We want to go directly to companies. Some of these vaccines, each of them cost about, like the Pfizer vaccine, each, yeah, I think each dose is um, $120. Um, uh, $120. And if you look at the uh, AstraZeneca one, about $80. So, uh, And these are sometimes more than some in some African countries, including Nigeria. This is over... This, this, this cost are uh, even above minimum wage for a month. So you can be talking, so, so you understand what we're talking about. So the, 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 the issue now boils down to solely dependent. The African countries are now solely dependent on the COVID party of their WHO to get themselves vaccinated. And for us to now start thinking about getting Africa to the point of herd immunity, which um, we can possibly say that even though everybody's not vaccinated, at least 70%. Now, if you look at 70% of uh, 1.2 billion, we're talking about having uh, at least 800, uh, 800 to 900 million doses available between now and next year. Uh, and that's a long shot. That's a serious long shot. All right, so, um, President um, Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa has said that they're, they're considering regional hubs of production of these vaccines. Um, vaccine production is not something you can achieve in just a day. It's a factory and you need to put a lot of things together to be able to um, get to that point. Even countries where it is being produced, it still takes a lot of time to meet, to meet demand. But if the African Union uh, you know, uh, was to pull this country together and say this country is together and say let's do something as a continent and not just as you know, countries individually going at this, how, how possible will that be? Yeah, it's possible because um, when you talk about Africa, um, it's not all, all African nations, their economic powers that are not equal. Like in, in the, the economic power of South Africa and um, you're talking about a stable, um, a stable Libya uh, or, or a, a few other countries or maybe uh, Rwanda. They, they, they definitely have good, uh, um, credible power to be able to do these things. But another thing is, uh, who, who comes first in terms of when you want to um, distribute this thing? But I, I think the, 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 the most important factors is, do, do Africa, are, are, are we, do we have the credential to be able to go to Pfizer, go to um, AstraZeneca, go to Moderna and say that we have met your production um, requirement to be able to um, uh, produce these things? Uh, I know a, a lot of things in Africa, once it gets into um, the actualization, sometimes either politics or government, government instability or maybe it's so, so much of um, a, a lot of, there's there, there so much of, um, let me put it as 
uh, this credibility when you talk about vaccine or um, when you talk about Africa getting involved in um, some of these key um, issues. So that that will play a, a very big role. But I, I don't doubt the fact that if the African Union could come up with um, one or two centers where the vaccine production actually can be taken in Africa, that uh, can be taking place in Africa, that alone will significantly reduce what we have been noticing in somewhere like Malawi uh, and uh, Botswana, where um, by before the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine will get to Africa, about two, three months would have elapsed, and you can only store some of these vaccines for a period of two, three to four months. Uh, and before they start distribution, vaccination, the expiry date is almost closed, and some of them are not usable. So what you have just said, I, I think if Africa will want to work with WHO, that will possibly be one of the credible way forward in terms of citing some of these production sites. Because we already have um, AstraZeneca giving its license for production to countries like India and um, Japan. So Japan and India are already producing some of these vaccines. So if the same can be done in terms of where, what Africa is able to put on the table, I, I think we'll go a long way to solve this problem. And then one also has to consider whether these, um, these vaccine manufacturers will be re willing to release the patent, especially when you also have to guard against issues around um, counterfeit products in Africa. But we also know that um, the G7 countries are, are looking to donate or give out about a, a billion doses of vaccines, not just to Africa, to um, the COVAX scheme. And that's for about 131 countries. Africa is about 54 countries in that 131 countries. How long can Africa depend on COVAX to meet its demand? Well, I think at the moment it is quite pitiful that we need to depend on COVAX because, like I said, alternatively, you can the purchasing power of Africa, we can purchase some of these vaccines going directly to the company because they, they, they are very expensive. And another thing you want to look at is the fact that some of these um, Western world, UK, America, Canada, that are promising to make some vaccines available to Africa, are not going to do it for free. Yeah, that it's going to be, um, you're going to exchange something for another thing. So, in a way, you have to ask Africa, uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is the fact that uh, at what point are we going to be able to grow uh, in terms of our health system, in terms of our economy, in terms of our governance, to be able to give credibility, in order to be able to do things by ourselves. Because these nations are, are not just, it, it's there, they are just, they're also comprised of human beings that were willing to um, uh, uh, go extra mile to ensure that they are, they will become solution providers. I think that's the same thing we need to look at when it comes to Africa, that we need to be able to come to that point where we are part of the solution creation, we are part of the thinking, we are part of the people who are leading innovation. We are, we're not just going to wait uh, and say that Forgive me, say um, guinea pig. Uh, you don't want our people to be guinea pig. But I personally was part of the experimental um, phase in terms of some of these vaccines. That's personally. So if if, if you are going to be able to open up yourself, you are going to be able to try to reach out, live for something larger than ourselves, and then that's when you start seeing maybe a, a, a lot more, a little more respect for Africa, a little more acceptance of Africa in terms of being able to be sit on the higher table as a member, not just as an observer. I, I think that's what we should be looking forward to when we talk about Africa growing to be able to ensure that we don't, we, we, we're not going to be depending on the COVAX. We're able to do these things by ourselves. But it is a long shot. It is a long shot. So at the other end of this spectrum is um, vaccine hoarding and vaccine hesitancy in um, richer countries. And for, ex for, for vaccine hesitancy, we've seen countries like America use um, every means to ensure that people go to go take these vaccines. For example, you get free ride, you get there's just so, so many things attached to it when you take the vaccine. And now in the Philippines, uh, President uh, Rodrigo Duterte is saying, take the vaccine or you go to jail. That's how bad it is now in some countries. So, I mean, at, at what point, where's the line in ensuring that people take this vaccine beyond just pushing an awareness? Where's the line? Um, I, 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 like I said, that um, 
we it is as much as I understand that things like the AstraZeneca are causing blood clots and also the argument that um, um, things uh, ailments like HIV virus have been existing for over 30, 40 years and people have not been able to develop um, vaccine. So uh, all of this, in a way, will cause um, vaccine hesitancy and making people have some doubt if these vaccines are actually going to be beneficial. But I, I, I just think that in terms of awareness, in terms of sensitization, in terms of creating credible campaign, in terms of the government willing to come to the ordinary people to engage stakeholders. In, in Nigeria, let's look at involving pastors. If you involve people like Adeboye, Oyedepo, even the cler Muslim cleric, <laughs> allow them to um, become part of those sensitizing people to go and get these vaccines. It, it, it's going to, it's, people are likely going to believe they are, um, they are, they are possibly religious um, leaders even more than the government because of um, a lot of um, disconnection between the central government and the people. But the, the issue of saying that people take the vaccine or go to jail, I, I think it's I think it's poor thinking from uh, President um, Rodrigo Duterte. The same thing you will probably have said with President Buhari saying um, if Twitter deletes your message of calling for war, you have to ban it. I also think that is poor thinking. You, you have to come in, in a way where you can uh, uh, credibly engage the people. These people are not fools. These people, are, uh, these people know how to clothe themselves. They know how to look for their daily living. They know what it is to be alive. So if, you're going, if you want to come and convince them, you have to look for how, what extra can, I, can we put on the table in order to be able to bring out my people to come and participate in this vaccine because without having this vaccine, without getting vaccinated, it, it is very unlikely that government, business and other mm. essentials will be able to go back to normal. So mm. I, I still think that that's where the government needs to focus on credible um, information. Absolutely. I'm um, looking, um, looking for that, the right way to ensure that people go to um, take these vaccines every from every, every way you can you can encourage people is just acceptable without also violating their human rights um thank you so much um medical doctor femi Yiko, it's always great to have you help us make sense of all of this you're welcome